Hello everyone, it's Dr. Sam. I'd like to welcome you to my Eye Clarity Podcast. This is a show that offers cutting edge information on how to improve your vision and overall wellness through holistic methods. I so appreciate you spending part of your day with me. If you have questions, you can send them to hello at drsamburn.com. Now to the latest Eye Clarity episode. Hey everybody, it's Dr. Sam, and I want to welcome you to another Eye Clarity Podcast. So before we get to today's show, I wanted to let you know that you can now text me your questions, 1-844-932-1291. That's 844-932-1291. Or you can send me your questions via email, hello at Dr. Sam Byrne. So today, I want to revisit a subject that I talk a lot about. It's called astigmatism. And in astigmatism, well, (laughs) the way I define it is that it's a twist, a turn, a warp that's in the eyeball. I've done a lot of video blogs on, on astigmatism. And it just brings a lot more questions to me. So today, I want to delve very deeply into this topic. And they're they're kind of different aspects that I have learned about and that I apply when I help people reduce their astigmatism. So let's bring in one of my reference books. It's called The Dictionary of Visual Science, and I'm quoting, astigmatism is a condition of refraction in which rays emanating from a single luminous point, this is an object in space, are not focused on a single point by an optical system, the retina, but instead are focused as two line images at different distances, generally at right angles, to each other. So in layman's terms, what this means is that when light enters the eye, if you're nearsighted, the light focuses in front of the retina. If you're farsighted, the light would focus behind the retina. And the astigmatism, it focuses in multiple places. And this is due to the fact that the the eyeball, if we just talk about the structure, becomes more egg-shaped as opposed to being round. In optometry school, my professors taught me that astigmatism occurred when light entered an eye that was egg-shaped, and the light focused on more than one part of the retina simultaneously, and this created a blur that was warped. But there was never a mention in my optometry training about the mind-body connection to astigmatism. And as I delved into my physical eye therapy protocols, and I started to explore the deeper aspects of astigmatism, I made some discoveries, which I will get to a little later in the article. But first, let's talk about what causes astigmatism. So there are many causes One could be just an irregular curvature in the cornea, that's the the front surface of the eye, the clear window, or there could be also a distortion in the lens of the eye. In fact, when people start developing cataracts, sometimes astigmatism will, will be able to be measured by the eye doctor. Astigmatism also tags with nearsightedness, and farsightedness. So you can be nearsighted and then you start developing astigmatism or you can also say start wearing magnification glasses, bifocals in the magnification plus lens and you also start developing astigmatism. Many times when I measure astigmatism, there's a fluctuation, it varies. 
And this is why people can experience fluctuations during the day. I get a lot of comments. How come my vision goes up and down? How come some days are better than others? A lot of time, it's the astigmatism that gets worse, gets better, and it's based on many things, stress and how you hold your eye muscles and what kind of things you're focusing on, what your prescription is, and so on. So corneal hydration is very important. I talk a lot about that. And when you start straining, squinting, or tilting your head, or you start twisting your body while you're focusing, this also can influence the development of astigmatism. So what are the types of astigmatism? You go to your eye doctor and he says, well, you've got astigmatism, it's this power. But astigmatism is based on the shape of the eye and let's go through the different types. So the first one, very common, it's called with the rule astigmatism and it means the vertical part of the eye is more warped than the horizontal part of the eye. Number two, there's against the rule. And this is astigmatism where the horizontal part of the eye is more warped than the vertical part. And then we have oblique astigmatism, which means that the diagonal part of the eye is more warped than either the vertical or horizontal. And then we have Number four, irregular astigmatism, meaning that neither the horizontal, vertical, or oblique parts of the eye are warped, but the distortion moves around based on your posture, your stress, and your lifestyle. So some of the symptoms that occur when you start developing astigmatism, blurred vision at distance, at near, double vision in one eye, crooked looking lines, eye strain, and you can even get migraines. Now, some of the causes that uh, cause astigmatism would be things like corneal dystrophies, like Fuchs syndrome or keratoconus, or just dry eye. There is a genetic influence. Uh, It's maybe about 20%. But I would say the biggest factor that causes astigmatism is the environmental influences that you put on your eyes. And this could be due to the type of job you have, how much stress you're under, or even your diet. One of the new causes that I'm now seeing with astigmatism is When you get the eye injections for wet macular degeneration and diabetic retinopathy, that researchers are now measuring corneal astigmatism after these injections. Cataract surgery is another reason why we develop astigmatism. And finally, these conditions called pterygiums or pinguaculas, these are growths over the cornea, if left untreated, they can actually grow on the cornea. These can also cause astigmatism. Now, mainstream eye care, the way they deal with astigmatism is, you know, they measure your eyes in an exam and then they fit you with the amount of astigmatism that they're measuring either in glasses or contacts. So they're basically reinforcing the astigmatism that you bring into the office. Another thing that I have to bring in is LASIK surgery. I've done a lot of video blogs on LASIK and the pros and cons, but it's a slippery slope when you do LASIK surgery that you could develop astigmatism after the surgery. So just to remind you that when you go for mainstream eye care and you have astigmatism, they're going to want to correct you for it full time, full on, no questions asked, because their feeling is that 
They want you to have the best resolution you can. Well, there might be another option. Stay tuned. What I want to talk about now is what does posture have to do with astigmatism? And I want to bring in one of my mentors, Dr. Elliot Forrest. And he was a professor at the State University Optometry School. And one of his hypotheses was that there was a relationship, is a relationship between how we scan our eyes repetitively. We call that visual tracking. And we might scan them in one direction for a long period of time, say if we're reading or you know, working back and forth on a computer screen. So the relationship between how we move our eyes, how we hold our head, especially if it's in an angled position, and could this cause astigmatism, especially in the eye that might, we might be overusing. So one of Dr. Forrest's students, Dr. Paul Harris, he wanted to test out Dr. Forrest's theory. So what he did was he took two musicians who played for the Baltimore Symphony. And Dr. Harris, first he worked with a trombone player, and he observed the trombone player where the musician had to look more to the right, which caused the left eye to chronically look more to the left. And... When he did that, when he measured that, he found that there was more astigmatism in the left eye. Dr. Harris also observed a cellist, and her music was set up so that She was off to her right, and her posture was looking that way. Again, the left eye had to twist and turn chronically to the right. The the trombone player, we also, I said the left eye looked left, but no, the left eye looked right, and that was the eye that had more astigmatism in it. This was for both musicians. So the the key principle is... Function alters structure. So the way we use a part of our body, in this case our eyes, if we use it repetitively, it creates a structural change, which in this case was astigmatism. So what Dr. Harris did validated what Dr. Forrest's theory said, that, again, if you do eye scanning repetitively, and you have to tilt your head or your body, that you're going to develop more astigmatism. So one of the principles that I like to use when working with a patient is that any vision problem is more than in the eyeball. It's in the whole person. And when someone measures astigmatism, and I start applying complementary protocols, this actually can help neutralize or even reverse astigmatism in the eyes. So one of my techniques, and this is kind of radical, is I prescribe lenses without astigmatism. So even if you measure it, I make you up a second pair where it doesn't have the astigmatism. And this is only used during the physical eye therapy period of time or in non-demanding, non-threatening situations. Since astigmatism is highly influenced by how we are using our eyes in relation to our body and our posture and our movement, if a person starts to develop a more integrated, fluid-type movement pattern in their daily routine, the astigmatism starts to disappear. Another technique I like to use in conjunction with no astigmatism correction in the eye is craniosacral therapy. So cranial work is a way that you can help unwind the twisting in the body. 
I call it body astigmatism. And what's really interesting is that when somebody receives craniosacral therapy and it does unwind or release the astigmatism in the body, if you then put on a non-astigmatism correction in the eye, the craniosacral treatment holds much better and there becomes this communication link between the eyes and the body. Whereas if somebody puts their strongest stigmatism glasses or contacts in after the cranial session, a lot of the benefits that they receive during the session are negated because the eyes have such a strong pattern on the body especially if there's a twisting or a warping in the eyes that you're looking through, your body is going to follow that, that pattern. And so what we want to do is we want to heal the split between the eyes and the body. And the way to do that is to start introducing lenses that are more symmetrical, that don't have astigmatism, that aren't overcorrecting you, so that the body work that you receive will integrate with your eyes. I also think it's really important that if you're going to do a process of reversing astigmatism, you really have to do physical eye therapy exercises to help the eyes and the brain reprogram the pattern of the twisting or the warping. And... In my notes, I'll put my 90-day program, Eye Clarity program, to reverse astigmatism. It works really, really well. And finally, I say this a lot, diet has a huge influence on our eyes. So eliminating sugar, reducing or eliminating gluten, stop eating all those chemical preservative, processed foods, GMO, Anything that creates more inflammation in the body is going to solidify the astigmatism in the eye. Make sure you're getting the following, vitamin A, vitamin B, vitamin E, vitamin C, trace minerals like magnesium, selenium, chromium, zinc, and the antioxidants, lutein, zeaxanthin, astaxanthin, and bilberry. And finally, make sure you get healthy fats. I like omega-3, the ratio of omega-3 to omega-6. One to one would be ideal, three to six. A lot of people, they have too much omega-6, and this creates an inflammatory response in the body. I would say the ratio of two to one, six to three, would be about the highest you want to go. So in summary, reversing astigmatism is a process of unwinding the eyes and body, and it does take time to release it. And if you have eye strain while you're wearing the non-astigmatism glasses or contacts, then just put on your astigmatism prescription when you need to perform at a high level and see clearly. But in the end, when you release the astigmatism, you will see the world without distortion which can be very freeing and empowering. So that's our show for today. I want to thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, take care. Thank you for listening. I hope you learned something from the iClarity podcast show today. If you enjoyed the episode, make sure to subscribe on iTunes or Spotify and leave a review. See you here next time.